Saturday, January 25th, 2020, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. Uh, today, I want to talk about how even the globalist uh, sapien <laughs> or the Davos man is turning around and thinking like a Maneco 64, like the contrarian. Uh, yes, who's the Davos man? Well, he's the globalist corporate uh, leader or political leader that attends the World Economic Forum every year uh, in Davos, Switzerland. Very, very expensive resort, of course, in Switzerland. Uh, and uh, the particular Davos man is Scott Minard. He's the chief investment officer for Guggenheim Partners uh, on Wall Street. And who are Guggenheim Partners? Well, I'll tell you who they are. Uh, Guggenheim Partners is a global investment and advisory financial service firm that engages in investment banking, asset management, capital market services, and insurance services. Assets under management, $270 billion. Yes, uh, Wall Street, <laughs> the globalists, uh, the people who benefit from the central banking largesse are actually turning on, uh, how can I say, uh, the people who feed them <laughs> and saying, look, this is too much. And after I talk about what uh, Mr. Minard said, I'm going to look at some charts, particularly of gold uh, and silver and uh, the gold silver ratio. Scott Minard also said, uh, surprisingly, that his gut trade, if he had to go with a trade for 2020, is silver because silver is so undervalued versus gold. And that's why I'm looking at the, uh, the gold-silver ratio. First of all, let's look at what uh, he, he's been saying. Uh, I've also got like uh, his global CIO outlook uh, from their website. You can access access it yourself. I'm going to put a link to it below in the description. And then I'm also going to put a link uh, to his interview with Bloomberg at Davos in Switzerland, where he talks about how the whole uh, stock market is a Ponzi scheme and that it's the Fed that enables it with their loose monetary policy. I saw the other day as well that... Uh, Paul Tudor Jones, uh, like one of the uh, godfathers or <laughs> founding fathers of the hedge fund industry in the 80s, he said the same thing. He said the fiscal and monetary uh, landscape <laughs> is uh, amazing. Uh, it's so loose that uh, he's never seen it before. So, yeah, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to play what he said. I'll put the, the, the link to uh, his Bloomberg interview. It's on uh, YouTube, B Bloomberg Markets and Finance YouTube page. Uh, I'll put it up in the cards as well. You can listen to his interview with Bloomberg. It's very interesting. It's seven minutes long. But a lot of what he says on Bloomberg TV is related to his uh, January 20th, 2020 uh, outlook. So we'll go through it right now. Uh, and then we'll go through the charts. Um, so this is from Guggenheim Partners or Guggen Guggenheim Investment Management. So this is what he says. Global central banks fueling a Ponzi market. Well, if it's a Ponzi market, uh, I would say it's a Ponzi economy as well. So this is what he says. One of the topics that I am focused on in Davos is the deterioration in the quality of the corporate bond markets. Well, what's the corporate bond markets? Well, it's uh, the market where corporations borrow money. They issue bonds, corporate bonds, unlike the U.S. Treasury. Uh, they're supposed to be riskier than the U.S. Treasury because the U.S. Treasury can just tax people. Uh, they can issue it, to, uh, they have the monopoly. Corporations don't have monopolies. They have to compete against other corporations and they're not going to get the taxpayer to fund them. Sometimes they do, of course, through the treasury, like in 08. But anyway, 
this is what he's saying here. And very few people uh, look at the bond markets, but the bond markets are bigger than the stock markets. The bond markets uh, are at the base of the equity market. They provide the liquidity and the capital for equity markets as well. So let's keep reading. The disturbing trend is that despite the rally in risk assets in the prior year, the number of defaults rose by approximately 50%, according to data compiled by JP Morgan. <clears throat> Additionally, the number of distressed exchanges increased by 400%. This correlates well with our observation that the number of idiosyncratic defaults has been increasing. Ultimately, markets will need to reprice for this rising risk with increased bond spreads relative to treasury securities. What does that mean, increased bond spreads? Well, that just means that uh, corporate bonds uh, right now uh, are not yielding too much more than treasuries. The spread between the 10-year uh, yield, for example, and a 10-year corporate bond uh, is very low. For example, the 10-year is at 166. Let's say uh, Acme Corp, uh, 10 year yield is only at uh, 2%. The spread is 34. Uh, he thinks the spread should widen to more like 100 or even 150 basis points so that uh, it reflects the risk of corporate uh, uh, debt. Uh, however, that day of reckoning when spreads rise is being held off by the flood of central bank liquidity and international investors fleeing negative yields overseas. So that's, uh, uh, well, the bank, central bank liquidity, of course, is the Federal Reserve uh, supporting the repo market. It's the Federal Reserve doing QE, uh, buying uh, short-term T-bills, 60 billion a month. They've increased their balance sheet by about 410 billion since, um, I would say, end of August last year and even in the interview with Bloomberg he says uh, the Fed is doing QE it's uh, disingenuous for them to say that it's not QE he says in the end of the day they're large-scale asset purchases <laughs> call a spade a spade I'll continue and let's not forget downgrade risk of triple B's today 50% of investment grade market is rated triple B and in 2007 it was 35 percent more specifically about eight percent of investment grade market was triple B minus in 2007 and today it is 15 percent uh, all this means is that uh, the uh, quality of the bond market is decreasing more and more investment grade uh, bonds have less quality uh, compared to 2007. And why is that? Well, because investors have had to chase uh, yields uh, because of the uh, policy of the central banks of keeping rates at zero or even negative. They, they push investors to buy riskier stuff, uh, junk. Uh, it has more than quintupled in size outstanding from 800 billion to 3.3 trillion. He's talking about the triple Bs, which is just a, a notch above uh, junk. We expect 15 to 20% of triple Bs to get downgraded to, to high yield in the next downgrade wave. High yield just means junk. You might think it's a good thing to be high yield. No, but it's a junk bonds. This would equate to 500 to 660 billion and the largest fallen angel volume, volume on record and would also swamp the high yield market. Fallen angel, I guess, is just uh, when a bond goes from being investment grade to non-investment grade uh, or junk. And a lot of investment firms uh, like Guggenheim Investment Management through their covenants, they're not allowed to uh, invest in junk. So once a corporate bond goes uh, below triple B, it, uh, 
yeah, it's really bad. <laughs> uh, even though, who knows, they might even change their covenants, uh, the investment firms. Ultimately, we will reach a tipping point, says Minard, when investors will awaken to the rising tide of defaults and downgrades. The timing is hard to predict, but this reminds me a lot of the lead up to the 2001 and 2002 recession. Yeah, the Fed can keep trying to uh, keep things going. In the end of the day, it's the consumer that will trigger it, in my opinion, when they can't pay off their loans, their debts, uh, when they retrench from consuming, that will hit the corporations that issue the debt. It's like a yeah, chain effect. And the Fed can't do anything about that unless they go and uh, drop uh, Federal Reserve notes at people's front doors. But then that's that's the end of the purchasing power of the Federal Reserve note. Not that it has that much left. The prolonged period of tight credit spreads experienced in the late 1990s lulled investors into unwittingly increased risk at a time they should have been upgrading their portfolios. So prolonged period of tight credit spreads. That just means that those uh, spreads between corporates and uh, treasury were too narrow for too long. Basically, people were taking too much risk. This brings to mind the famous observation by economist Hyman Minsky, who stated that stability is inherently destabilizing. That is to say that long periods of relative stability in risk assets causes investors to keep upping the risk during a long period of calm. Sorry about that, Billy uh, is snoring. Actually, Billy's getting a bonus today because when we came down to do the video, he followed me. Usually I have to tell him, you know, get on the sofa. <laughs> he was actually, I went to get my coffee. I came back, he was on the sofa. He was, well, he's been really good. So I'll finish off this, uh, report from Guggenheim from Mr. Uh, Minard. Ultimately, this leads to what he called a Ponzi market, where the only reason investors keep adding to risk is the fear that prices will be higher tomorrow, or in the case of bond yields, uh, bond yields will be lower tomorrow. Daniel Kahneman observed this behavior in his own work when he identified that investors' fear of missing an opportunity induces them to buy when they should be selling. I think he talks about uh, Kahneman uh, in his Bloomberg interview. I think he's a, a Nobel uh, Economics Prize winner. So let's finish his uh, report here. Even though the recession clearly has been put off until 2021 and perhaps 2022, in the lead up to the 2001 recession, credit deterioration started to be evidenced three years earlier in 1998 as defaults and credit spreads were rising. This would sound like good news for yield starved investors and I would agree, but patience will lead to bigger opportunities for disciplined investors who don't wander off into exotic asset classes or chase current returns. Uh, I agree with him. Yeah, you need to be patient. Uh, keep your uh, powder dry, so to speak. Uh, gold and silver are good places to be, of course. It's like holding uh, cash. Well, they are cash, really, technically. And uh, they will tend to do well in the next recession. Uh, not only because they're counterparty uh, risk-free, but also because the central banks are going to keep uh, inflating the system. So really interesting uh, newsletter uh, talking about how it's just getting uh, bubblish and bubblish. The other thing that happens in the corporate bond markets, a lot of corporations issue bonds uh, and they, they take the proceeds, which is cash, and they buy back their stocks. So that's the other point I would make as well. So interesting. You will see in the interview, they ask him at the end. Uh, what's your uh, 
trade for 2020 you're, uh, that's in your mind, so to speak, and he said silver. So uh, with that, uh, let's look at the uh, gold-silver ratio uh, because he says that silver is still 65% below its high from 2011. Gold, of course, is still below the high from 2011, but much closer to that high. And that's reflected in the uh, gold-silver ratio. So I'll, I'll first show you a chart, a long-term monthly chart you can see here in 2011. Uh, you only needed uh, about 32 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of gold. When the precious metals topped uh, in 2011, gold above 1900, silver just under $50. And ever since then, that ratio has been going up, which means gold is outperforming. You need, right now you need 86.79 ounces of silver to buy one ounce of uh, gold. Uh, and you can see that uh, in the last 30, 30 years, um, we're at uh, overvalued levels for gold relative to silver. Uh, yes, it's uh, <laughs> that ratio has been really sticky. It's really stuck up there. Um, seems silver is having a tough time. So uh, let's look at a shorter term chart, see like how this uh, ratio looks. Late last year, of course, it looked like that ratio was on its way down, but it's picked up again uh, since December. But uh, yeah, it looks like we're forming a massive head and shoulder here. We have the left hand shoulder <laughs> going all the way back to the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, uh, 2019 mainly being a big head for that head and shoulder formation. And right now we are on the evolving the right hand shoulder. So we'll have to keep an eye on this. Uh, silver is still very undervalued versus gold, as uh, Scott Minard said in his Bloomberg interview. And I agree with him. Uh, does that mean I'm selling all my silver to buy gold? No, it just means that if I'm going to buy more precious metals, I might buy a little more silver than gold. But as I always say, it's up to individual to the individual to decide what he wants to buy, not me. Let's quickly uh, look also at the 10-year uh, yield, which is something I didn't say earlier we're going to look at. But I think it's giving us signs that yields are going to drop again, that uh, maybe the stock market is not going to do as well because it's going to be pointing to a slower economy. And you can see here, um, this is a 10-year yield chart going back like five years. It's a, a daily one. Uh, we see how we reached 325 uh, towards the end of 2018. That's when the Fed had to reverse, when the stock markets were under pressure. They stopped uh, raising rates. They stopped uh, unwinding the balance sheet because it was a mess. It wasn't like watching paint dry like Janet Yellen said it was going to be normalizing things. So ever since then, uh, they knew the, re the recession was coming. They've tried to uh, avoid the recession, uh, the Fed, just like Scott Minard said. They're trying to push it further into the future. So the yields have dropped a lot. We got down to like almost 140 uh, back in September last year, and then they've picked up again, and now they're falling back. We're back below 170. To me, it looks like the rise from 140 to almost 2% was like a consolidation, and we're going to go lower. So all that means is that uh, the real yield for treasuries, by real yield, it means if you take the, uh, the rising cost of living, the rate of uh, inflation, if you want to call it, minus and you subtract that from the yield it's it's getting negative and when that happens it's very good to have gold because if you have cash you're actually losing purchasing power so let's say the 10 yield drops to one percent and we've got uh and i'll use their uh measure of inflation which is a joke uh, let's say it's two percent so you do 1% minus 2. So if even if you put your money in 10-year uh, treasuries, you're losing 1% to uh, inflation. And I would say that uh, the rate of increase of prices is a lot more than 2%. Check out shadowstats.com. It's more like 5 
or 10 for all the necessities of life. Uh, the rising prices are much higher than 2%. So that's only going to keep helping precious metals. Uh, I just wanted to show you that, the 10-year yield. All that means is that bond prices are going to go up. It's probably going to keep uh, <laughs> those corporate bonds uh, bid. So the, the, the spreads are going to keep tightening a, a little bit more uh, before they widen like uh, Mr. Minard uh, expects them to do. So let's finish off and look at the uh, gold and silver uh, charts. Gold and silver did very well yesterday, especially silver it outperformed. Uh, first of all, I'll show you the weekly chart. So that looks pretty good. We're still, in my opinion, in the consolidation period. Uh, even though we, we've had a very good week, we closed above 1570 in gold. The other uh, key level to look at, of course, is the previous high that we had uh, last year at 1555 or 56. We've been able to stay above that. So that looks very positive. Uh, could we still consolidate for a while? We might, <laughs> just like we did last year before we moved higher to 1555. Or we could be on the way up right now. Uh, it's always difficult to, to tell with markets. So it's looking very good, uh, the weekly chart. I want to show you the monthly chart, which is even more interesting. Monthly chart looks very good, actually. And uh, it's actually telling me that we could have a very good end of the month next week. We could actually go through 1600. I don't like to make predictions, very short term predictions like that. But if I had to bet, I would bet that it would go uh, higher next week. Uh, let's look at silver to finish off. Mr. Minard's favorite uh, trade. Uh, of course, some of you do trade. I don't trade silver. I hold it. But let's look at it anyway. So here's the daily chart. Yeah, I, it still doesn't look like uh, there's a buying signal there. I would say we need to go uh, above 1880 or 19 for it to really start looking good. But it's made a move. It's above that falling wedge. Uh, it's got a lot of room uh, on the upside. Just show you uh, the monthly chart of silver. Uh, this is what uh, Mr. Minard was talking about. We're still way below the highs from 2011. There's a lot of room in silver. Uh, and Mr. Minard might just be right about the 2020 trade. Uh, before I finish off, I just wanted to say that I will be back uh, for the Sunday live stream uh, tomorrow. I didn't do one last week. Uh, didn't have the time, unfortunately. Um, my Sunday live stream, of course, is the original Sunday live stream uh, exposing uh, our Ponzi system, monetary system, and the central banks. So don't miss it. It's going to be at uh, 4 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time, the usual time, um, and 9 p.m. London. If you enjoyed this video, uh, please hit the like button. Uh, share the video far and wide, uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet, uh, make sure you hit that little notification bell above uh, to be notified of all my new videos, uh, and you can also follow me on Twitter, BitChute, Steemit, and DTube. I wish you all a great weekend, take care, bye.